So, um, we're going to do going to do three different things up here on the stage, and the first thing I want to do is read you something that isn't mine. Um, I'd known Becca for about four years before I knew that she was a poet. She sent me a very, very nervous email one day with a bunch of poems in it, just wanting my opinion. Um, and they were beautiful. And I thought I would begin by reading one of them to you. And this is called Diluted Chinese Ink Poisoning. <laughs> I never found the sermon in the suicide, but these are the things that have held my attention. A name as original fiction, a borrowed idea twice over, a second sin, this the face I had before the world was made, eyes blue, black as a bruise, and already knowing that this must be the world, hurt the way the world hurts God. You, building shadow boxes in your bedroom, pot after pot of semi-hot coffee, and turning the corners down. Now, apotheosis by appointment. Now, we know too much, we read highway signs as semiotic warnings. We die stillborn to avoid rejection. I never found the lesson in the murder of five, and now Dietrich is dead. But still we keep the key light, eight feet up and a little to the right. Yeah! So, every now and again, I direct a film. <laughs> Not very often, but it happens. It's like a picking a spot, you go back there. And a few years ago, I wanted to make a film about human statues called Statuesque. And uh, I figured I... I knew who to cast as the lead. Because <laughs> I was on very good terms with an ex-professional human statue. <laughs> and when I got to ask her who else I should cast in it, we were looking for human statues, Amanda said, Becca. She's amazing. So Becca flew to England and I cast her as an airman in a film. It's a very, very short film. The brief was make a silent movie, and I did. And it stars Bill Nye. <laughs> and it's called Statuesque. We're gonna watch it now. suggestions from people on Twitter. I asked them questions like, why is January dangerous? Or whatever, and I would get these wonderful Twitter replies and then picked 12 and wrote a story for each month. And a project that was sponsored by Blackberry. Um, 
and I wanted to read two of those stories tonight. <coughs> At least one of them. Maybe both of them. And Rebecca, in the back of my head, they were all written very shortly after she passed. This was the one I wrote for November. The brazier was small and square and made of an aged and fire-blackened metal that might have been copper or brass. It had caught Eloise's eye at the garage sale because it was twined with animals that might have been dragons and might have been sea snakes. One of them was missing its head. It was only a dollar, and Eloise bought it, along with a red hat with a feather on the side. She began to regret buying the hat even before she got home and thought perhaps she would give it to someone as a gift. But the letter from the hospital had been waiting for her when she got home, and she put the brazier in the back garden, and the hat in the closet as he went into the house and had not thought of either of them again. The months had passed, and so had the desire to leave the house. Every day made her weaker, and each day took more from her. She moved her bed to the room downstairs because it hurt to walk, because she was too exhausted to climb the stairs, because it was simpler. November came, and with it the knowledge that she would never see Christmas. There are things you cannot throw away, things you cannot leave for your loved ones to find when you are gone, things you have to burn. She took a black cardboard folder filled with papers and letters and old photographs out into the garden. She filled the brazier with fallen twigs and brown paper shopping bags, and she lit it with a barbecue lighter. Only when it was burning did she open the folder. She started with the letters, particularly the ones she would not want other people to see. When she had been at university, there had been a professor and a relationship, if you could call it that, which had gone very dark and very wrong, very fast. She had all his letters paper-clipped together, and she dropped them, one by one, into the flames. There was a photograph of the two of them together, and she dropped it into the brazier, last of all, and watched it curl and blacken. She was reaching for the next thing in the cardboard folder when she realized that she could not remember the professor's name, or what he taught, or why the relationship had hurt her as it did left her almost suicidal for the following year. The next thing was a photograph of her old dog, Lassie, on her back beside the oak tree in the backyard. Lassie was dead these seven years, but the tree was still there, leafless now in the November chill. She tossed the photograph into the brazier. She had loved that dog. She glanced over to the tree, remembering that. There was no tree in the backyard. There wasn't even a tree stump, only a faded November lawn strewn with fallen leaves from the trees next door. Eloise saw it, and she did not worry that she had gone mad. She got up stiffly and walked into the house. Her reflection in the mirror shocked her, as it always did these days. Her hair so thin and so sparse, her face so gaunt. She picked up the papers from the table beside her makeshift bed. A letter from her oncologist was on the top, beneath it a dozen pages of numbers and words. There were more papers beneath it, all with the hospital logo on the top of the first page. She picked them up, and for good measure, she picked up the hospital bills as well. Insurance covered so much, but not all. She walked back outside, pausing in the kitchen to catch her breath. 
The brazier waited and she threw her medical information into the flames. She watched them brown and blacken and turn to ash on the November wind. Eloise got up when the last of the medical records had burned away and she walked inside. The mirror in the hall showed her an Eloise both familiar and new. She had thick brown hair and she smiled at herself from the looking glass as if she loved life and trailed comfort in her wake. Eloise went to the hall closet. There was a red hat on the shelf she could barely remember, but she put it on, worried that the red might make her face look washed out and sallow. She looked in the mirror. She appeared just fine. She tipped the hat at a jauntier angle. Outside, the last of the smoke from the black snake-wound brazier drifted on the chilly November air. And uh, not a lot of people know, and uh, not a lot of people knew until I was interviewed by the Boston Globe and mentioned it, um, that as far as I know, the main reason that my wife, Amanda, agreed to marry me um, was that on New Year's Eve 2009, uh, Boston Pops gig, backstage, Amanda, who was sort of nerving herself up for the idea that I might at some point soon actually be seriously proposing, said, so, Becca, what do you think? Should I marry Neil Gaiman? And I held my breath, because I figured Becca was an arbiter of taste and opinion. And Becca said, duh. <laughs> and I knew I was in. <laughs> this is the July tale. The day that my wife walked out on me, saying she needed to be alone and have some time to think things over. On the 1st of July, when the sun beat down on the lake in the center of the town, when the corn in the meadows that surrounded my house was knee high, when the first few rockets and firecrackers were let off by over-enthusiastic children to startle us and to speckle the summer sky, I built an igloo out of books in my backyard. I used paperbacks to build it, scared of the weight of falling hardbacks or encyclopedias if I didn't build it soundly. But it held. It was 12 feet high and had a tunnel through which I could crawl to enter to keep out of the bitter Arctic winds. I took more books into the igloo I had made out of books, and I read in there. I marveled at how warm and comfortable it was inside. As I read the books, I would put them down, make a floor out of them, and then I got more books and I sat on them, eliminating the last of the green July grass from my world. My friends came by the next day. They crawled on their hands and knees into my igloo. They told me I was acting crazy. I told them that the only thing that stood between me and the winter's cold was my father's collection of 1950s paperbacks, many of them with racy titles and lurid covers and disappointingly staid stories. <laughs> my friends left. I sat in my igloo, imagining the Arctic night outside, wondering whether the northern lights would be filling the sky above me. I looked out and saw only a night filled with pinprick stars. I slept in my igloo 
made of books. I was getting hungry. I made a hole in the floor, lowered a fishing line, and waited until something bit. I pulled it up. A fish made of books. <laughs> Green-covered vintage penguin detective stories. I ate it raw. <laughs> fearing a fire in my igloo. When I went outside, I observed that someone had covered the whole world with books. Pale covered books, all shades of white and blue and purple. I wondered the ice flows of books. I saw someone who looked like my wife out there on the ice. She was making a glacier of autobiographies. I thought you left me, I said to her. I thought you left me alone. She said nothing and I realized she was only a shadow of a shadow. It was July, when the sun never sets in the Arctic, but I was getting tired, and I started back towards the igloo. I saw the shadows of the bears before I saw the bears themselves. Huge they were and pale, made of the pages of fierce books. Poems ancient and modern prowled the ice flows in bear shape, filled with words that could wound with their beauty. I could see the paper and the words winding across them, and I was frightened that the bears could see me. I crept back to my igloo, avoiding the bears. I may have slept in the darkness, and then I crawled out and I lay on my back on the ice and stared up at the unexpected colours of the shimmering northern lights and listened to the cracks and snaps of the distant ice as an iceberg of fairy tales carved from a glacier of books on mythology. I do not know when I became aware that there was someone else lying on the ground near to me. I could hear her breathing. They are very beautiful aren't they? She said. It is Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, I told her. It's the town's 4th of July fireworks, baby, said my wife. She held my hand and we watched the fireworks together. When the last of the fireworks had vanished in a cloud of golden stars, she said, I came home. I didn't say anything, but I held her hand very tightly and I left my igloo made of books and I went back with her into the house we lived in, basking like a cat in the July heat. I heard distant thunder and in the night while we slept, it began to rain, tumbling my igloo of books, washing away the words from the world.